Are you feeling resentful, burned out, and underpaid at work? We have created a masterclass for you. It's called Beat Burnout and Build Wealth. Three simple steps to scale your income without changing jobs or specialties. If you want to join us, here's how it works. Tap the link in the show notes or go to tracybingaman.com slash masterclass. Choose a time that works for you and then bring your A game to the masterclass and be ready to take notes and then take action. Doing nothing and not attending this masterclass results in nothing. And unless you take action, you'll keep earning that same below market value income, feeling resentful and burned out. Change requires action and signing up for the Beat Burnout and Build Wealth Masterclass is the first best step to take. Head to the show notes or tracybingaman.com slash masterclass to be the first to have access to your preferred dates and times and to find one that works for you. We'll see you there. Welcome to the PA is in the show created by PAs for PAs where codependency with your supervising physician is a thing of the past. Optimal team practice is the future and physician associate has taken the place of physician assistant as the professional title of choice. I'm Tracy Bingaman and I'm obsessed with redefining what success as a PA looks like and what it feels like. Here you'll find the mindset shifts, systems, and processes I use to escape healthcare burnout and integrate my work into my life. Work-life balance is a myth and an integrated life where you thrive professionally, not a balancing act, is the goal here. My mission is to help you to grow into a unicorn PA who loves their job, has abundant energy, time to spare, and work optional financial freedom. The PA is in. All right. I want to play a little game with you. I'm going to say something and I want you to say out loud, if you're not in front of a bunch of people, the first thing that pops into your mind, direct to primary care. If you're anything like me, you're thinking about that show, Royal Pains, where that doctor in the Hamptons is a concierge doctor to all these super wealthy people, where they're coming to their house and saving them from various emergencies, which by the way, they have a PA on that show. And it's actually highly entertaining. But direct primary care, it turns out, is not this ritzy, super expensive concierge way of practicing medicine. It is a way that eliminates insurance company from being in the room with you and your patient when you're providing them with primary care. We're going to talk to a PA today who switched from insurance-based primary care to direct primary care, who's going to share her experience and how she finds her job more fulfilling and less stressful while still making a huge impact on her patient's life. So without further ado, here she is, Julia Harris. Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on the show. Awesome. I would love it if you could take a minute and introduce yourself to our listeners. Tell us a little bit about you and why you wanted to go into medicine and become a PA in the first place. Okay, so do you want the long version or do you want the textbook version? <laughs> well, whichever. I think okay. we're probably going to get into some of the more details later. So, All right. so my name is Julia Harris. Obviously, that's not my original name. So I grew up in China and I came here when I was in college. And then um, so things happened. And then I became PA. I got married. So now here I am. My name is Julia Harris. So how did I become PA? So when I was little, like when I was like five years old, my dad, um, my birth dad, he was sick with cancer. And then he died when I was seven. And so at that time, I remember like on his, in his funeral, I said, yeah, I'm going to study medicine. I'm going to save people from cancer, blah, 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 blah. So then in college, I chose, um, I chose bioscience as my major thinking that I would go into, not really into medicine, but really into research to do cancer research. And the reason I did not choose medicine at that time, um, oh, backtrack a little bit. So in China, so the system is that when you go into college or four-year college, you can already choose medicine. But I didn't at that time because people told me, don't go into medicine, it's a lot of work. So I said, okay, I'll go into research. <laughs> Which is also a lot of work. <laughs> right, yeah. But then, um, so I was originally going to a PhD track, and I came here halfway through college, went to college. And uh, after graduating from UT Austin, I went to MD Anderson and became a research assistant. And so everything was pretty much going my way, right? But I was kind of 
this illusion when I was when I was doing research, research assistant there, seeing what the scientists were doing, and just to see how the the cancer research was going the whole direction. So it didn't really align with what I envisioned while what I was going to do. And also, I didn't really care to stay in a lab and uh, dealing with test tubes. I found myself more um, interested in dealing with real people. So then some scientists at that time said, that, well, why don't you become a PA? I was like, what is a PA? I, I didn't even know what a PA was. They're like, well, it's like being a doctor without having to go to medical school. So I look into it. I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? This is actually really good. I already had a late start compared to other med students. So this might be a good route. So I did my prerequisite and did all the stuff and I got lucky. I was accepted to UTMB Galveston and did my trainings there. And that's how I became a PA. So and, uh, I graduated in 2014 and then started practicing in family medicine. And uh, I was in the family medicine field since then. I think all family medicine providers need a special kind of trophy because you have to know all of this stuff about all of these various disease processes and everyone comes to you and expects you to fix everything in 15 minutes while they're there for their <laughs> for their cold. So in this setting of primary care doing family medicine, did you feel like you were really able to reach patients and help them to improve their health and feel good? Yeah, it's funny you say that because when I was in PA school, I didn't think I wanted to do primary care. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to do ortho or surgery because that's more honest work. And also you also make more money. But then when I came out and when I was looking for a job, I thought, man, the school really trained me well with all the primary care stuff. I don't want to come out and then immediately go into a specialty, then lose all the knowledge I've learned. So I thought I was going to test out primary care and uh, have a better foundation after a couple of years and go into specialty. But after a few years, you know, I, it's family medicine. So you see the same people over and over again, and then they do become attached to you. And I do feel like there is a relationship. So I stayed at my previous job for nine years. And um, really, it's more for my patients than for the job itself. And I think you'll hear that from primary care providers over and over again. So that's a common theme. Yeah. I think that happens to a lot of people where they start to dislike their job, but they love their patients so much that they feel very torn between making a change and getting a different job that might be more challenging, more fulfilling in a different specialty for them, but that they know that there's no way that they can take all of those patients from their previous specialty or from primary care with them to ortho or surgery or nephrology or wherever it is that they are going. So, I would love to talk about from someone who's been on the front lines of that primary care, which I feel like comes with a lot of health screenings and insurance and various frustrations that come along with dealing with insurance as you're trying to take care of patients. How do you feel like that system is working? Is it, you know, serving patients well? Is it failing to meet the needs that our patients have? And what can we as providers do about that? So first of all, I want to say that I, I don't know how many providers really know um, in, I don't know if, and if there are enough providers who really know enough about how involved insurances are. Uh, when I, uh, and uh, there was in school, there was no training. They were like, okay, you know, these codes, I see the 10 codes, you, you, you're going to learn on the jobs and it's for insurance purpose. So that's all the education I got from school. And I was lucky that one of my preceptors, he was a private surgeon, and he told me the in and out of the screwy system of insurance. I just put that in there. And I did not realize how uh, in like non-transparent it is. Right. So a lot of times as providers, you don't really know how much how much money you're making from your patient, how much money you're making from insurance for the same service if they have different insurances. So it's like no no other trades would 
provide a service without knowing the value they provide. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's very strange. It's very confusing. It's unclear. And I think oftentimes in practices, it's not communicated to the provider. So that practice probably knows what you're making from Highmark versus Aetna versus Blue Cross, but the provider is seeing 99204, you know, and, and just on to the next, on to the next. They're putting in their note. They're either dropping that billing charge or the billing person is. And the provider is sort of, I don't want to say ignorant, but like blissfully unaware that they're, how they're getting paid, what they're getting paid, because their paycheck is clearing. But also, it is a strange thing. Like You would never hire a plumber and say, the plumber comes to your house and takes care of your plumbing, and he builds, a, builds you a code, and he charges you $200, and he comes to my house and does my plumbing, and he charges me $400, because I have an insurance company that's contracted to play the plumber a different amount. It's, it's a very weird system with this third party payer. So you had a surgeon who sort of said like, Hey, you need to know how this works. Then how, as a provider who's out and taking care of patients, did you go about getting more information about really understanding how it works? And well, you know what? I don't think I really did having get more information than what I already knew. Uh, I work in a very a small private practice. We had a biller, in-house biller at the time when I first started. And she kind of educated us on what you can do, what we're going to do, what you should not do. So and they gave us a pretty minimum education just to boost our billing. But the way I was paid was just simple salary. There was no RVU, there's no bonuses. And a part of the reason was that it was not tracked very well. So my boss kept on saying that, yeah, I want to have a, a bonus structure, but it just it was never in place. So I don't know if he had trouble tracking it. Right? And, and then I learned different things here and there, but it was just never really it was never enough for me to know exactly how much I was doing. And eventually we changed EMRs and had a, a newer system. And uh, right before I left my previous job, we started to have monthly meetings. And it kind of gave us a breakdown of um, the gross revenues that we generated. And uh, but there was no there was no like itemized like how much RVU. There was still no RVU stuff. I don't. I still don't know how to do RVUs. So but I was shocked at saying that I, I was working part time at times, three days a month. I mean, three days a week, and I was generating about thirty thousand dollars per month for the clinic. And I had no idea whether it was high or low, but I was getting paid maybe five. No, not even five thousand dollars. So. But we were eight, we were we had to do all that in order to just keep the clinic afloat. And I knew the clinic's financial state was not very great. It was just barely keeping afloat after COVID and whatnot. But still, it's like if I am generating thirty thousand, then but I'm only getting one sixth of what I'm generating. Where did all the other money go? And how do I improve? But our management was also a little bit messy, so they didn't even give us any um, suggestions. I know there are practices, they are very well managed. They tell the providers this and that, and you can do this and that. So I think that put uh, a different type of pressure on the providers, though, because now you're calculating every cent you're making, and then your patient sometimes may, even unconsciously, may not become a patient anymore, maybe more like, ooh, you are someone that I can generate more revenue from. So that feels kind of off as well. Are you sick of getting mystery beef at the grocery store from some unknown corporate production line? Promised Land Meats offers premium beef raised from a family farm, personalized to your family's needs and delivered to your door. We've been a customer of theirs for over a year and we love the meat. Even Dan, who is really hard to impress when it comes to beef, won't stop raving about the quality of these cuts. You can truly taste the difference. Choose the farm to family subscription plan and get a customized farm raised beef box shipped to your door every one, two, or three months. Skip the grocery store and shop with your American farming family by going to promisedlandmeats.com or click the link in the show notes. 
Yeah, I do think it has the, once you understand that each of the patients has a billing code and that billing code is tied to a number of dollars, you can start seeing Mrs. Smith and see, oh, 99204, which equals X amount of revenue if you're on that productivity bonus. Or even if you don't have a productivity bonus, but you work at a practice that really prioritizes those numbers, that sends out that spreadsheet. I used to be part of a practice um, that would send out the spreadsheet and it had myself and all the other advanced practice providers. And I could see my numbers and a breakdown of my numbers and like charges for the month. But also I could see all the other APPs and that bred a lot of discontent because we were, th- well, what is he doing? What is she doing? What, why am I above, below, behind? You know, it, it started to feel like it was a game of comparison and not that we were focusing on compassion for our patients and giving those patients what they needed. I have found a lot of practices are just like you described yours. They're either intentionally unclear because they don't want providers to know what they're earning or they are disorganized and they don't get it. So I don't think they're all doing it from a position of trying to swindle their PAs or NPs. I think most of them don't truly understand how PAs generate revenue, how sometimes it's billed under their name, but sometimes it's billed under their physician name, depending on if it's a private insurer or Medicare, they get lost in the weeds and they just say, it's too hard to track what this person is doing. We're going to put it all in the bucket of revenue and we're not going to care if it came from Tracy or if it came from Julia, if it came from the physician, we're just going to say revenue is revenue which is fine from an accounting standpoint, but not fine when you go to ask for a raise or when you say, you know, I want to be more productive. I want to add more value. I want to take better care of my patients. And then your data is sort of non-existent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I know in my previous work that I knew we were doing a lot more than we were billing for, uh, which is almost like a punishing for good work, right? Because our clinic was awesome as from the patient uh, perspective. They loved coming to us even they, when they had to wait for a long time because we actually spend time with them. We address things. We don't stop them as three complaints. If they have seven complaints, and I will try to address them all because they're all important and they are all relevant. That's what family practice is doing. So, but we cannot bill above what, like three or four complaints. So, and if you come here for code and I also do a UTI and do other stuff, I can never bill it to a 994 or 214. It's still going to be a 213 code. So, by doing more work doesn't really generate more revenue and that's really bad for business. Yeah. So I, when I hear that, I think that was me, right? So you're, you're salaried, you're doing what's right, right? So objectively seeing that patient addressing as many of their complaints as you can do reasonably safely and get the history, do the exam, do the appropriate workup and refer them out. That's the right thing to do, right? That's what we would want. If we were the patient, if we came to an appointment, we would say, yeah, I want you to help me as much as possible with all of these things. But by doing that, we create more work for ourselves. We we create more charting for ourselves. We don't get paid anymore. Our practice doesn't get paid anymore. It's more work and you still get paid the same amount of dollars for that day. So your treadmill is going faster. You're working harder. And then you just inevitably feel burned out and resentful. Did you start to feel burned out as a part of that practice? Uh, I... Guess maybe it's uh I I I'll say that I am I I can stand really really high stress. I had two natural births unmedicated, so <laughs> that would indicate something, right? But my I think I was lucky enough that my boss was uh, very hands off, so he trained me well, and then I was just on my own. Um, my discontent is more due to the disorganization of the, the clinic. And I saw him, he was the one who was burned out. So, so me personally, if I was burned out, I had my own coping mechanism. I, I, I went from full-time to part-time after I had my kids. So I had more free time to, to compensate that burn, burnout. But if you ask my husband, yeah, I 
he would probably say that, gee, you know what, you're always pissy. So I guess I was a little bit burned out. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I think that humans are very resilient. So just what you described, hey, you know, I had this high level of stress. And then, you know, once I had my kids, I went to part time. What that does is creates more margin in your life. So you have more time to spend time doing things that you enjoy. You have more time to cope with that stress because I don't think there's anyone working in any part of healthcare who is like, my job is zero stress, right? There's always going to be something that needs to be done, something that needs to be ordered or reviewed or one more patient that needs to be seen. And I think that's, it's something that's not going to change, but what we can change is how many hours a week that we work and our schedule and the environment that we're working in. So you used to work in a clinic, in an office doing insurance-based primary care. Now tell us what you do now and how it's different. Okay. So I still do primary care. So it's family medicine. We take urgent care as well, which is really should be part of family medicine as well, but it's direct primary care. So it's very different. We do not take any insurance. It's all cash based and it's not also not fee for service. So it's membership based. So our members, they will pay a flat monthly fee and it's all encompassing. Anything that we can provide in the office, we try to include in the membership fee. So the only time we would uh, charge more is if they do blood works. By the way, we give them a wholesale price for the blood works, which is way cheaper than even with, with insurance copay. And then um, maybe occasionally if we need to do like a big procedure and or if we need to use some third party stuff, but that's pretty rare. So uh, it's really, really awesome because people don't have to worry about, well, I cannot get in. I have a UTI, but uh, they cannot see me for another week. Now I have to go to urgent care. We have a time for them. Uh, or in, they don't have to limit their compliance to two or three complaints at a time. If they have 10 complaints, we have time to address it. We are also not limited to just in-office visit because we no longer need to see patients to generate revenues. We already have the revenues um, when they become a member. So it's uh, it's... It's already there. So, so therefore, there is an incentive to keep them healthy and out of the office versus the traditional interest-based fee-for-service uh, type of care that model that you, you have the incentive to have them come into the office, bill them, and charge them for each service. So that there's a huge difference. So I would say that this is the way primary care should go in the future. Most PAs bring home a decent paycheck, but aren't sure that they're investing enough or what approach to take for student loans. Caleb Pepperday is a certified financial planner who works specifically with APPs. Seeing that PAs, including his wife, were overlooked and physicians were treated with respect in the financial planning industry, he sought to rectify this mismatch by serving PAs with the excellence we deserve. Caleb's mission is to help make financial planning affordable for APPs regardless of their asset level. Head to advancedpracticeplanning.com and hit the schedule a conversation button to book your free consult. Your money is your largest wealth building tool and failing to utilize it well could leave you wanting to retire without enough in your accounts or still having student loan payments when your kids are ready to attend college themselves. Caleb's clients can enjoy their money guilt-free while feeling confident in their savings and investments. Head to the show notes, tap the link, and call Caleb for your free consultation. On the call, Caleb will help you to determine whether his one-time or ongoing financial planning services are right for you. So I would love to hear how your day is. How many patients do you see? How is it different from when you were working in insurance-based primary care? Okay, so uh, for me currently, because I'm still new, I'm still trying to build my patient patient uh, panel. And by the way, my panel, my goal panel is about 600 patients. And as you know that most primary care panels is anywhere between 2,500 to 4,000 patients, right? So my goal panel is about 600. So I, I'm way below that the um, marker right now but i can tell you that just my my current boss he already has a full panel and his his full day if he has a really busy day he sees about 10 patients 
Yeah. So for me, I have a few patients that uh, they are a little bit higher need. So I do, I do communicate with them more often. But on a busy day right now, I think the the busiest day I've been, I saw about five patients. A lot of times I basically stay in office, answer emails, check labs, and do some referral stuff, and do research. They have some weird complaints like, why am I feeling fatigued? And I think it's this and that. So and I can actually do the research and tell them, no. Don't listen to that TikTok. That's not right. And uh, here are some legit research. Let's go this route. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a lot of contact with patients. Are you calling, emailing them? Are you their primary point of contact if they need something from the office? Yes. Yes. So that's a little bit different from the traditional, the conventional clinic as well. Is that uh, we do have an MA and he does a lot of stuff. But as far um, as like calling patient back on their labs or doing some coordinations, it's more the providers that would do that. And um, for one, it's just better because I, I actually see the labs and uh, I can call them and I can talk to them. So there is not that other third party and I have to go through a nurse line and ask question. Nurse saying that, well, let me call you back and send you a message. Yeah, they ask question, I can answer them right there, right then. And also like family practice and primary care is supposed to be a hub, right? So uh, ideally you would like to know if they went to a specialist, what did the specialist do? So, and then who did you refer to? Did they go see their specialist? So then by doing all those things myself, I know better. I'm more in the loop with the patient care. Yeah. Awesome. It is, it's totally different. Like it seems like a complete switch. Like when you were saying earlier, our goal is to keep patients healthy and not come in versus if you work in primary care, you're like, in order to keep the lights on at that clinic that you're at before, you were like, I need a full day, right? I need patients to come in and be sick, which is very strange because no one wants their patients to be sick. But when we're getting paid because they're sick, we sort of do maybe subconsciously. Well, we need them to come in so that we can keep the lights on so that we can keep getting paid for the work that we're doing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, and you see how like tenure medicine right now is so popular and uh, there's a reason for it because patients or people don't want to bother have to go into a clinic when they're already sick and get more sick. And also they don't want to wait because their time is valuable as well. Their time is money as well. So with the DPC model, because we have direct contact with patients, so a lot of things can be done through phone, email, texting. And if your blood pressure has been controlled well, and uh, you have been on this medication forever and everything else, you're doing great, you just need the medication refill, then, and I know you because I've been your provider for a long time, then why do I need you to come into the office just so we can have a face-to-face to to refill your prescription, right? There's no medical reason for that. That's more of an insurance reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's a a made-up rule that someone decided, right? You have to be seen every six months to get refills, or you have to be seen once a year to get these things refilled. So I am... I'm curious to hear, do you see a very different demographic of patients than you did when you saw insurance-based primary care? Because what you're describing, I'm thinking, is this is this so expensive that it's cost prohibitive for people to be a part of a direct primary care practice? Is it all people in that like upper middle class that have, you know, income to burn? Or do you see middle class? Like what is the demographic of who you're seeing? Um, so So different DPCs, they operate differently. There are a lot of clinics, they would have uh, ancillary services that geared towards the higher income. We are not trying to do that with our clinic. And we're really trying, I mean, one of our slogans is uh, concierge for working class. So we're, we try to price it very reasonably. And, uh, um, and then the place where I am at, we, it's not a high income and place either. It's just working class, blue collars. Um, as far as uh, the income base, it's uh, it's not 
you don't see people who are on Medicaid, that's for sure. And they do have to have some kind of disposable income. But you actually see a lot of people, it's that those people who fall in the hole, like people who make enough money to not qualify for any assistance, but they don't make enough money to really be able to afford health care insurance. When you, if you are a self-employed, a small, um, like a self-employed or a small company who may, may or may not offer very good insurance, then you still have to pay four, five, six hundred dollars a month on the premium. I mean, that can be a big chunk of your income, right? So people would rather just take a risk saying that I'm not going to have any health insurance and I'm going to save my money. But for us, we charge $90 a month. Yeah, so they can, and there is no way for them to get any sort of insurance, regular insurance for that much. And if you don't have insurance, you go just get a, a visit, it's more than $90. Yeah, so this is this is really, really good for those people who may fall in a gap and give them some sort of medical coverage. And honestly, if you have a good primary care coverage, and it should, we should be able to take care of 90% of your medical need, so that we should be able to reduce your risk of having to go to urgent care and ER, and that really save money, save more money for them as well, and keep them healthy. Yeah, for sure. Now, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, okay, these people are sort of in between. They're not... Um, they may be underinsured or uninsured, and so they're electing, but they still want some coverage in this form of healthcare. So you are their coverage, not an insurer, but the provider that's taking care of them. What happens if they need to see an orthopedic surgeon or they need to have their gallbladder out? What if you discover something that does need to see a specialist or some someone outside the realm of primary care? So we tell all our clients that we cover the basics, but you should still have a catastrophic type of coverage. And so some people would elect to go with a high deductible and other people, they would do a health cost share program. So there are some faith-based and there are some secular ones. So those would work for the emergency big bill stuff. Yeah. But then again, if you think about this model is that if we're able to keep people healthy enough so that UTI does not turn into a pyelonephritis or that URI does not turn into bronchitis and uh, into pneumonia, then your risk of having to go to the ER goes down dramatically. Yeah. Are there studies that show that people who have direct primary care or have better access to primary care utilize emergency services less? There are. I do not have any anything in front of me. Yes, I believe you. <laughs> there, yeah, there there are extensive studies that showing a comparison, and and also another way of utilizing DPC is that a bigger organization uh, or some medium sized business, and they would pair DPC with a self funded insurance health insurance for their employees. And there are studies showing that when they do that, and they it really save the company the money because they have to spend much less money on, on the acute care and on the bigger care stuff. Sure. And I can imagine the people that are seeking out direct primary care are people who have self-selected to care about their health, that this is a priority of theirs. And also that they have said like, hey, even if you had traditional insurance, I wasn't super happy with the way that it went and the care that I received. Do you see those people as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have people who still have their traditional insurance, either they bought themselves or maybe their company pays for them. So they have that part covered, but they're like, you know, I can never get to see my doctors or my insurance changed again. So now my previous doctors or my previous providers don't accept this particular insurance anymore. So with a DPC clinic, when you have a provider you like, and then you are establishing that relationship directly with the provider. And so you don't have to, you don't, you're not limited by the system. So you don't have to switch your providers based on your insurance coverage. They can still use their insurance as like a true insurance for catastrophes, catastrophes, but not for their day-to-day maintenance. 
Yeah, and going back to earlier, like say that it, they just don't have any other forms of insurance or coverage, and what if they need to see a specialist? So we do have a network um, that there are some specialists that they would also take cash pay patients, or in some cases, maybe even do a pro bono case. Right? I know because we have the time and we have the energy to really go out and network and get all those resources. We try to do everything we can to direct patient to the right person instead of just telling them, ah, you know what, you need to go see an ortho for that. So now it's the ball, the ball is in your court, so you need to do that. So we, we initiate a lot of referrals and we'll tell them this is the person. And there was one time that a, a person came and then he really needed some pain management. And so what I did was that I called a few pain management doctors that I knew and asked them how much they would charge for this case. So I did the work for the patient before I told the patient what they what he would expect. Then he can make an informed decision if he wants to go to any doctors that I refer him to. Yeah. It sounds to me like this would be so much more fulfilling as a provider. Like you would have relationships with your patients that were deeper and longer and also that you have more time to spend with them. And I mean, that is way above and beyond what I think people at a primary care office who's taking insurance are typically doing for their patients. Have you found that you feel like less burdened by and like you're more enriched by the relationships that you have with your patients? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the patients, they would come in and they tell stuff and I, I'm not in rush thinking that I only have 50 minutes so I don't have time for small talks so but they can actually tell us stuff and um, I can tell them stuff and uh, during that conversation you may pick up some more information and like yeah I've been drinking a lot more it's like no don't do that but there's a reason for it or a stress stress level and that's the big thing is that everyone has a lot of stress everyone has depression anxiety but what I always felt like in the past is that I knew those things are important we need to address it um, most people they don't have the time or the money to go see a therapist and, and I also feel like a lot of time you just need some guidance I didn't have time in the previous office to really talk to them talk through things but if they want to talk in our current office, yes, I can. I'm not a licensed therapist, but I have common sense. I can talk to them about certain things just on a human level. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that human element is really what we're we're missing from a lot of our interactions that are happening in healthcare. We've made it, you know, we have electronic charting, we have electronic check-in before you get to your appointment. And that human connection has really been minimized where if you have a 15 minute visit, you know, maybe it's six, seven, eight minutes that you actually spend in a room with a patient. And that includes interview, you know, your exam, discussing the plan with them. Well, that feels really pressured. Like having, even if you had nine minutes, three three minutes to talk to them, three minutes to examine them, three minutes to tell them the plan and get them bought in to be compliant. Like, no, even the best, most seasoned provider is going to struggle to foster deep human connection in nine minutes or less, right? That's a really hard thing to do as a person. Right. Exactly. So I'm curious to the, there are people listening who have been working in primary care for a long time, or maybe even are working in medical subspecialties who are saying, that sounds amazing, right? This sounds like such a better position than the, the traditional insurance-based positions that as PAs we've been told are available to us. So if someone's listening and they're like, hey, I would like to find a direct primary care office in my in my region or, you know, either to be a patient or to ask them if they need an awesome PA like me, how did you make this transition? And what advice do you have for that person who's like, that sounds like a much better job than the one I have currently? So first of all, listen to a lot of podcasts. So honestly, I did not know about DDC until I listened to one of the podcasts. I don't remember which one, but it's one of them. I was like, oh, this is a really cool model. Man, I wish I could do it. I knew about concierge, but just like you said, I always thought you know, concierge is super expensive and then there's no place. And 
So when I heard about this, I was like, this is really, really cool. And then a few months later, um, I was just browsing on Indeed and found that there was a job opening about BPC, like a, it's a BPC clinic. So I applied and then one thing leads to another and eventually I started working with my current boss. So if you want to, if you want a change, you first need to know there are, are there are available options. Right? If I did not know what the DPC was, then even when I saw that job opening, I probably would not have applied to it because I would be like, this is too weird. This is so out of my my knowledge. So I, I don't, I'm not going to venture out and take that risk. But because I knew already, so now I'm like, oh, this is a good opportunity. So you need to know what you're, you're going to. Um, so DPC is actually a, a thriving community and thriving movement. And uh, there are our Facebook groups for DPCs and there are our websites out there. A very simple way is you can actually go to dpcfrontier.com and they have a map. So, oh, it's actually mapper.dpcfrontier.com. So that's where they have a they have a map with full DPC, a lot of DPC practices. Now, I would say that this is still a very MD dominant field because most, most clinics are small. It's just one doc and then they take care of their patients. As they grow, they may choose to partner with another doc or they may they may hire an advanced practitioner. Okay. So you, know, you, you, and because our PA limitations, at least in Texas, I, I cannot open up my own practice. Yeah, so it's, uh, you cannot really, it's not easy for you to, to open up your own clinic and just start going this model. So it, there is a little bit hurdle for PAs for sure. But yeah, I don't think you would uh, have trouble if you really look into it to uh, find a like-minded MD to become a partner and uh, be hired. And so you just need to dig a little. And I also know a few PAs, at least a few PAs, mm, through the, the online um, communication that they work for DPC clinics. So before I jump into this um, this position, I asked them and then so they were all like, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, so there are PAs out there, there are PA opportunities out there for sure. Absolutely. And I think one of the great things about having someone like you on the show is that someone will tune in and say, Hey, number one, I didn't even know that this existed. Or number two, I sort of knew that it existed, but didn't know if it was too good to be true. And hearing from someone who's doing it is going to give them the insight to say, okay, yeah, that definitely does sound like something that I, I want to do. That seems like a worthwhile step in my career. If we can't visualize it, if we don't know that it exists, it's really hard to make that step. Honestly, sometimes it can feel really hard to make that step, even when we do know that it exists. And we do know we tune into this episode and we say, Julia makes it sound so great. She applied, she got a job. Now she works in direct primary care. Did you feel like this was hard or scary to make this change into this unknown where you hadn't worked in this setting before? I figured that with how hard my previous job was, this was not going to get any worse. Yep. That's a good, I've been there. Same. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but this was definitely going to be different. One thing that kind of scared me a little bit was that we were supposed to have a more deep relationship with patients, right? They would have my cell phone number. Uh, it's through a work phone, but still, they would have direct communication with me. So I think we are so comfortable to be hiding behind the barrier that uh, sometimes it's really hard to develop a real relationship with patients. And uh, what happens when if they see me in a uh, in a grocery store and then start asking me stuff? And um, what happens if they call me at ten o'clock on a Saturday evening? Right. So those things can all be possible. You yeah, know, and honestly, we try to address those things. But the good thing is that one, if they do come to me in a grocery store and say, "Hey, Julia, can you look at this rash I just developed?" Guess what? I'm not bound by the stupid insurance thing. I have to tell them that just come to the office on Monday. I will take a look, right? Because he or she or he is a member and I, I, I'm able to actually look at their stuff right there, right then. 
Yeah, and if they do call me on、um, a weekend night, I mean it's which is very occasional. So patients know they they respect their providers, so they try not to, and so they wouldn't call unless it's real emergency. And、um, I wanted to say one example that I had a, a pretty nervous mother, and then she texts me at nine o'clock in a Saturday evening saying, "My son has this rash. What's happening?" So and I text back her back and saying,、uh, asking what happened, and so I made a quick ass- assessment saying that this is most likely contact dermatitis, and he probably just got some irritation, and、uh, so let's watch. Uh, his symptoms and let's put some cream on it. And if he's still having problems tomorrow, and、um, you know, just give, give me some feedback. This mother was going to take her son to urgent care for a rash that, as a provider, we know that when we look at it, it's clearly a small case. But she didn't know that. So of course, the next day the rash went away completely. So I felt like, yeah, I just saved her a trip, and also I was able to comfort her. So that's awesome. Yeah, and、um, you know when you were describing sort of this, this how it looks. So typically, a physician opens up a DPC clinic, sort of builds that patient base, gets to the point where they say, "Hey, I'm at capacity. I've had, you know, I have enough patients on my panel. I'm looking to hire some, you know, someone to share this load with and get a PA or an NP in here, an advanced practice provider to help with this." That to me sounds like. The model that PAs were created to fill. So back when they didn't have enough primary care providers, it was you know Doctor Smith on the corner with the shingle on Main Street. Everyone went in, and that was their primary care doctor. And then they got to the point where there were too many people in the town, and so they had a PA that came in and also helped take care of patients. It feels. Very much like how the you know PA profession was developed to fill holes in providing care for patients. And I would also argue that there is more advantage for an MD to hire a PA or an NP than to partner with another MD if they're going into the DPC model. Because if they have two MDs, they have their own side panels. What makes it?、Uh, I mean, what prevents the new doc? From learning all the skills, learning all the marketing, and then just separate from the original dog, right? But as PAs, because we work together, and and then honestly, we're not we're not in competition with MDs, so we can together build the clinic bigger instead of taking it away from from them. Yeah, for for those PAs who have a really good relationship with their MDs, I would also argue that you might want to talk to your doc and see. It may, they might not know about the DPC model, so they might want to think about it. Then you guys can start a, a practice together. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Julia, this has been so informative. I feel like there are very few areas of medicine where I find myself saying, "I didn't even know that this existed, or that PAs were working in this space." So I'm so glad that you shared your time with us today, and you're able to tell us all about what it's like. So thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Any time. I love any episode and any conversation that reminds us that the way that it's always been done is not necessarily the best and only way to do it in the future. So sometimes the insurance model is not the best model to promote wellness in our patient, and sometimes the idea of what we thought working as a PA would look like is not what we want it to feel like now that we're out and actually practicing medicine. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to another episode of the PA is in. This PA is out to go research direct primary care in my area and see if I can become a patient of one of the practices local to me. I'll see you next time. Congratulations, you've just joined an awesome club. By listening to a full episode of the PA is in, you are officially on the Unicorn PA team. Welcome aboard. What most team members do is they subscribe to the podcast because that allows them to automatically get the latest episode of the show. The life of your dreams exists on the other side of taking action. Keep making small shifts and keep getting better. Your life will improve, your career will soar, and you will have the confidence you need to create your own success. I will see you in the next episode. This PA is out.